So today we're diving into chapter 10, which mainly covers human genetic mapping and then introduces complex traits, also known as quantitative traits, okay? When we have multiple genes that are all contributing to the phenotype, one phenotype, okay? So we're gonna do most of this chapter. One thing we're not gonna go into is microarrays, okay? Because we, uh, that technology is not like top of the line anymore. Uh, and then we're gonna skip box 10.2, which is the uh, box on. Let me double check uh, the exome sequencing and direct searches. So, which is really cool, but I'm just not going to be testing you on it. But, so, let's jump in. So, why map genes? Okay, we talked about um, linkage in chapter nine, but we've got three billion base pairs in the human genome and tens of thousands of different genes. And then you've got all the protein isoforms that come from alternative splicing. So it's really complicated. Um, there's a lot of different phenotypes that we're uh, interested in, like just the whole genome has been sequenced, but that doesn't mean it's been completely annotated. We're still finding genes and discovering gene variants um, for different things throughout, not to mention all the different mutations that can arise uh, in these um, particular genes, especially what people are interested in, genetic diseases, things that are hereditary, passed down, and seem to have some sort of maybe either ethnic or regional component as to certain populations that are more um, prone to get different diseases or, or whatnot. Can we make recombination maps in humans? Can we take a human that's heterozygous for a bunch of uh, traits and mate them with a human that's recessive for a bunch of traits and see what the offspring are like? We don't do that with, we can do that with fruit flies. Uh, we can't do that with humans. So um, recombination maps are kind of the question. We have to look at what types of humans do we already have? And if we know a little something about their ancestry, that's great but uh, we can't use the same techniques that we do with other organisms in order to determine gene linkage and gene mapping in humans. So then that comes to the question, which is most important, knowing what a gene does. Um, okay, well, this gene causes a, a increased risk of something, something, or knowing where that gene is, okay, that's also really key because once we know where that gene is and we can see other genes that are like in that area and see whether or not they're inherited together, comes down to both are really important in terms of mapping, okay? Knowing the function and the position of a gene is sort of the ultimate goal. If we could know all of those for, for humans, then we would say the human genome is completely known, uh, which is not right now. We're still, that's still all that is being accumulated. We know pretty much where certain genes go, but we don't know all the gene variants, gene types, and um, all the possibilities within the human genome. So positional cloning, we talked about a little bit previously, but this is where if we know where um, two markers or sites are and we can get an idea that um, a gene that we want to know more about is in between those sites, you can map that area. You can sort of target your search down and, and it's easier to find what you're looking for if you know kind of where the start and the finish are. Okay. So we use this by picking two markers. Markers could be other genes. They could be SNPs. They could be um, like copy number variation sites, like anything that we know what's there. And then it's easy to sort of walk in from those two endpoints and look for a particular gene. Okay. It's the idea of positional cloning. The, the book explains it really well. Okay. So this is simple if we have one gene that's causing a certain trait, a monogenic trait. Um, things like whether or not you have freckles, one gene, a widow's peak, a free or attached earlobe, those are all controlled by just one gene. It's very simple. And that's the stuff we've been looking at uh, up until this point. Okay, so Mendel's peas or dog agouti or cats having multiple toes, those are all monogenic traits. And we were looking at how they combine. Um, and then in flies, we're looking at monogenic traits and seeing how they were linked. Are they the same chromosome or not? And now we're going to get into something a little more complicated, a complex trait, okay, where the phenotype is affected by more than one gene and possibly the environment. So things are just growing in uh, complexity here exponentially. Also known as a polygenic trait, okay. Um, other textbooks use polygenic, this one uses complex, and both of these are also kind of wrapped into, they have slightly different definitions, but functionally all are the same, kind of referring to the same thing where you have multiple genes influencing one trait. A quantitative trait is, is definitely one that 
can be measured, something like human weight, okay, or human height, something where you can throw a number on it. So like hair color would be a little difficult to determine quantitatively. I assume there's probably some way you can measure the amount of melanin deposited in hair structure, and that could be what you look at. But um, uh, so all three of these complex, polygenic, and quantitative. I'm going to say for now, we're referring to the same idea that there are multiple genes in the environment uh, contributing to a phenotype. So one of the coolest tools we have for looking at traits that are affected by multiple genes and trying to find out which of those genes matter and then which of those matter the most, okay, so something like a predisposition to breast cancer, right? Um, we are using these genome-wide association studies, looking at uh, hundreds of thousands of people, people with the condition, people without the condition, and trying to figure out, well, what do the people with the condition have in common that they don't have in common with people who don't have it, okay? So what, what genetic variation, what alleles, what genes are shared among people who have the trait but are not shared among people who don't have the trait? So everybody has a gene of the BC, BRCA1 gene, okay? But some people have a mutation of that gene, which leads to early developmental uh, breast cancer. So it's, I might say people who have the gene. What I mean is people who have the alleles for that gene, which cause a disease. So in the vernacular, it tends to be with a gene, but we know everybody has the gene. It's which, which variety of the gene is, is present. Okay. So here's um, one that was done, a gene so a GWAS study, genome-wide association study, done for type 2 diabetes, uh, reveals all these genetic markers that people have in common, but there's a certain point at which above, uh, these are the p-values, are like 10 to the minus 5, so something very, very significant. We have a few um, that are above that critical threshold and which are targeted as um, potential ideas for gene therapy, or is there a protein that they produce that is not produced, say, when the gene is broken, and could that protein then be a medicinal treatment for a particular um, disease? Okay. So here they're shown by chromosome number. This is, we'll get to what this, this type of plot is called a Manhattan plot, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but the higher the value, the higher that point for that particular marker, the more likely that is correlated with the presence of the disease or disorder. So how do we get all that variation in, in genes and allele markers and such from an ancestral population that possibly didn't have a particular uh, phenotype, like uh, a predisposition to breast cancer, okay? This is where the idea of molecular change over time comes in, evolution, and the idea that we're having constant chromosomal swaps and breakage throughout time. And so going back to chapter nine, when we were talking about linkage, okay, um, we in those linkage groups, the kind of clusters of genes that hang out together, those associations, those linkage associations persist over many, many generations. And it's only rarely that we get crossovers in the middle of those linkage groups or linkage associations, giving us those new um, recombinant phenotypes, right? So the most common thing you're going to see in, in a population is the... Um, setup that was the parental one, the one that's been linked together uh, over time. See box 10.1 about linkage disequilibrium, and also there's like a little, there's a video that I posted that goes into this in more detail, but we can trace back in time what genes were mo more likely to co-occur together by looking at what genes are currently assorting together. And we do this by looking at, a lot of the time, single nucleotide polymorphism, the SNP, okay? which sounds really crazy, but literally a, it's a single nucleotide. Let me grab my little marker here. Here's a single nucleotide. Okay. Like right there, that AT. Okay. So that when that gets switched and say it got mutated or something, now some individuals at that same site are now CG. A single nucleotide polymorphism just one spot in the DNA the nucleotide is different in that sequence okay so that's these are the most widely used molecular markers just looking at okay where in who is that DNA different it's very frequent it's usually not in coding regions it's more likely in sort of non-coding intergene regions doesn't affect fertility they can be scored independently a lot of times these are neutral mutations because they don't have a particular effect so they just they happen and they stick around, you can watch them for a while, okay? Uh, 
Now, to be considered polymorphism, the second most common allele must be greater than 1%. If you've got 99% or over of just one allele at any given place, that's not a polymorphism. It's just fixed. That allele is fixed. Okay. So you have to have um, the second most common allele be over 1% of the population. Okay. So that's the uh, definition of polymorphic there. Now we get into 10.4. So how are we going to use all these different like arrangements of SNPs? And what does that mean in terms of human history here? Well, we remember we talked about SNPs. So we've got these, there's one right there, boink. There's a couple of them. And so um, you can look at who has what set of, of SNPs, who has what set of molecular markers, which SNPs are more likely to co-occur together, which ones are less likely to be the same as everybody else. And then you can look at the frequency of these particular combinations, these haplotypes. Okay, These haplotypes are the set of alleles or polymorphisms within a linkage group that are inherited together. Okay, So crossover is not happening a bajillion times every every generation is just having a couple and so these haplotypes tend to stick together um, of course my little button there and turn off my marker okay so the SNPs on a haplotype indicate an ancestral linkage arrangement they've been like this for a while they're not likely to swap around during recombination and therefore we can kind of group those people together almost like in a family tree okay so a haplotype is a set of SNPs that have been inherited together in a linkage group. It's just like a little, this is where we get into genetic fingerprint, okay? You have a certain set of tiny little mutations that make you, you know, look different than other people uh, in, this, in the same, make you look different from other people, okay? So there's a video in Chapter 9 playlist that SNPs, haplotypes, and linkages equilibrium, and this guy explains it really well and concisely. So please go watch that video because he does it better than I could do. And, you know, sometimes you want to leave it to the experts for their particular um, set of things. Okay. So part of the haplotypes, you can get different haplotypes because of genetic drift. In one case, the founder effect, where you say like a, an ancestral population, only a few of them leave, and you get a totally different genetic makeup in the new area. Okay, a small subset of the original population has a drastically different ratio of genotypes and phenotypes because of the small sample size, and therefore rare traits can become really common. They're also going to take their, their, their haplotypes with them. The, so you'll see like the different, um, not just for one trait, but for a whole like swat, a little group of linked traits will move into a new area and then that linkage will stay the same for a long period of time. Okay. One example of um, uh, sort of this um, rare trait becoming common is this Ellis Van Krippel syndrome in Lancaster, Pennsylvania within the Amish community. So. Now we get um, kind of back to our idea we talked about um, molecular clocks, right? Both in the domesticating dogs lab and in the HIV clock lab, we looked at um, how fast genetic changes were occurring over time. They occur at a sort of regular rate and you could kind of track back in time as to when an original divergence happened by looking at the numbers of um, genetic differences between members of a population, okay? so. A common haplotype is the same kind of idea. The little the the SNPs that happened a um, long time ago can still be seen over time, and it carries along on that haplotype for many generations. Okay, so if you have a particular mutation, you're going to have a similar haplotype because that mutation is going to stick around in that particular thing. Okay. And so there's this idea that if you have a genetic disease that's common within a particular population, that most of the individuals who have that disease will have a molecular variant or a similar mutation in the causative gene. Okay. So the idea being, well, what if we can go find that gene and determine what's missing okay, or what's broken? So most of the individuals with the disease will have the same haplotype for the region surrounding the mutation, the causative gene, not just the one thing that's broken, but if there's, there might be other mutations nearby that we can also see, okay? Because people who are in those populations with that common disease somewhere back when had a common ancestor, okay? So therefore, if the haplotype can be identified, just 
not the disease mutation itself, but the pattern of mutations around that area, um, then you can find the location of the causative mutation. So again, this is sequencing is still a little pricey. You know, it wasn't you couldn't just go and sequence a whole genome, and you still have to sit down and annotate it. It's better to know where to look rather than just shotgun blast the entire human genome. If you can narrow it down to okay, it's somewhere on chromosome six. Uh, in between this and this gene, let me tell you, you're way more likely to get funding to go in and sequence all that and, if, and find all the variants if you can tell people where you're looking. Okay. So in parts two and three, I talk more about the complex trait part of this, but I want to kind of wrap up genome-wide association studies because uh, the chapter kind of deviates and then comes back. So, here we go. so a genome-wide association study is kind of a way of looking at since we can't do things like cross a certain amount of humans and see if their offspring are a certain way, um, to analyze the information that's already there and uh, see if we can't put together what traits are going along with what particular genes or loci or linkage groups. Okay, So in a genome-wide association study, what you do is you either do a microarray uh, or you do RNA-seq or you're looking at particular DNA, uh, sequence DNA for thousands of loci throughout the genome uh, for SNPs common in that population. Remember, SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms, so little groupings of little markers saying these people are very closely related to these people because of how many of these markers they share. Okay. So the genotypes of every individual, you kind of mark which markers they have. You're not comparing full sequences, just those particular markers. And then um, you take, you look, you kind of zoom out a bit and go, okay, which of these people are affected by this disease and which are unaffected? And you pool those out together. And then now you look within the pool of affected and see which SNPs or haplotypes are grouped together more often than they are in the unaffected pool. Okay. And then you plot that relative frequency out. Okay. And then you can kind of throw every, compare everything to each other and see which of these SNPs or haplotypes are most common in the affected population that are not common in the unaffected population. Okay. So, um, and then that allows you to know where you're looking. You can zoom in and look for those particular loci locations. I want to sequence this part of the chromosome because I think it's in here somewhere. Um, and then um, this is something that RNA-seq is doing where you look at, instead of uh, look at the DNA, you look at the RNA expression in certain cells. Uh, you can get very, very precise estimates that way. Hi. Okay. So similar to mutants in other mammals too. If you see something looks similar to a different disease, you can pull that out and start testing it. So this is a Manhattan plot. It looks like a kind of a city skyline with the skyscrapers all coming up and it's for uh, Crohn's disease. All right, so we've got this sort of scale here, the, the probability that the haplotype is associated with the trait. Um, we've got haplotypes that are grouped by chromosome and then each dot represents a various haplotype or um, the sort of region of SNPs that people have in common. And that if haplotypes have a significant association, if they're above this kind of five uh, threshold, is where they they're plotted in green and sort of stand out from from the rest. Okay, so it looks like there's at least 16 different locations in our chromosomes that are associated with the occurrence of Crohn's disease. Now, not everybody with Crohn's disease has all of these, but the more they have, the more likely they are to have Crohn's disease. So you could have different genotypes and a bunch of these different markers and still have the same disease. But this is where it gets interesting. If you look at each of these locations, different genotypes maybe respond to different therapies. A different link in a biochemical pathway is broken and therefore the drug they need in order to, to help their um, symptoms would be different per person even though they all seem to have the same disease. Okay, this is where um, medical research is really going, is getting to the nitty gritty of what exactly is the genetic component of this particular disease, so therefore we know how to, how to treat it. Okay. There are some limitations of these. Okay. There's, um, one of the big problems is that American, Canadian, European, and then you have Han Chinese and you have Japanese studies, and those are where the majority of genome-wide association studies are being performed, and that leaves out a huge proportion of the world's population. Um, so there's all this data, and that's great for the people in these particular groups, but doesn't help anybody else outside of these uh, ancestries. So there's a lot of overrepresentation of certain certain genotypes there. Um, 
also like how do we find a causative gene once you find the association pattern it's um you know do you do uh expression patterns so rna sequencing is is coming down in price but still expensive so finding out what genes are expressed in what places and locations uh looking at other um genes in other animals is there another phenotype that somehow correlates in say a, a laboratory animal where you could study the system more thoroughly and then looking at each of those particular is there a sp specific mutation in one of those um, haplotypes that really is is um, associated with that particular gene could, could that be a candidate for gene therapy down the line something like that so it's just identifying that there's an association isn't good enough you need to make a much more solid connection with a particular gene a particular phenotype and in humans you can't go knocking out people's genes and seeing what happens so it gets um, human research is compl complicated and messy and um, it's uh, better to see if you can find find a way to um, test it in another system or in the genome or something along those lines.